our series in Jude, we come to verses 14 through 16 today. So turn with me in your Bibles to June, Jude 14. And we'll read a little bit more than that just to give us some context. But we'll be looking specifically at Jude 14 through 16. And we'll pick up in verse 11. I know that's mid-paragraph, but uh, it picks up, uh, gives us a context of whom is being described here by Jude when we look at verses 14 uh, through 16. Jude, verse 11. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn twice dead uprooted. Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. So far the reading from God's Word. Well, goals, they are a, a common thing. They're, they're usually a good thing to have. We, we have goals in all sorts of different places in our lives. We see it often in, in sports. We have uh, the goal of getting a little round sphere into, in between two poles or a, a, a pig skin with looks like a, an egg through uprights. We have goals and, and we drive towards those goals when we're doing sporting events. We also see it in, in stories. When we read through a story, usually the writer of the story has a particular uh, lesson that he would like to communicate to his readers. It's in children's stories. You see it all the time. You see it in adult literature also. When you go to a lecture, there is something uh, that the lecturer would like to communicate to his readers. There is a goal for him, something that he wants to accomplish. The same thing is true in sermons. We uh, have a goal that we are trying to understand the Word of God and, and this particular part of the Word of God. And, and, and the preacher leads us through that process of understanding uh, God's Word. But it is also true for the writers of the inspired scriptures. Jude has a goal. He has something that he wants to accomplish as he uh, writes this letter to his recipients. And so today we come to that goal. We come to see what his purpose is. Why has Jude written this letter? And it comes out in spades Today. So we want to look at two things. First, we're going to look at judgment issued, and then we're going to look at judgment applied. Judgment issued, we will see in verses 14 and 15, and judgment applied, we will see in Jude 16. So uh, after the introduction, two brief verses that, that Jude gave to us, a, a greeting, acknowledging that he is writing to the church, those who are called, those who are blessed, those who are beloved, uh, Jude speaks to us immediately about his goal. He was, you remember, going to talk to us about uh, uh, the common salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. He was going to write a, a theological treatise uh, to his readers. He was going to write to them about the glorious truth of being in Christ's family. Uh, but that something happened. It's like he was sitting at his desk, and as he was about to begin writing on his parchment, he received a note. This is what's happening and so he changed. He changed what he was going to write about. Instead of writing about the, the common salvation in Christ Jesus, he began to write it to them, urging them to contend for the faith that was entrusted uh, to them. It became clear to him that the, the church was lax in its protection of the Scripture, that the church was not being diligent in standing for the truth, that false teachers had entered into the church, and that they were leading people astray using the grace that God has given to His people 
as an excuse for sensuality. That these false teachers were using the grace of God to deny the Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. The one who bought His church. The one who called His church. Or through whom the church has been gathered. They were neglecting this. And they were using instead the grace of God to indulge their sinful desires. And then Jude took some time to paint for us a picture of, of what these people were like. And we have seen that in, in three broad categories. We have seen that people could practice uh, the sin of, of unbelief, which was true of, of the Israelites when they were about to enter into the promised land, you remember. It was also true of, of Cain when God called him to repentance. And Cain said, I'll, I'll have none of that. I will be my own master. So we saw that there was a category of the sin of unbelief. There is also that sin of rebellion against the authority of God. We saw that in the angels. The angels who, who left their proper dwelling, it says in our, in our, in our book. It also uh, speaks of that of Balaam, who, who was supposed to go and, and speak only the words of God, but who we saw being involved in leading the people of Israel astray through sexual immorality and, and, and through uh, idolatry. This is another category of, of people. But there is a third category. The, the third category that is, is pointed out to us is, are, are these people who, who reject Christ's authority and then, and then do so boldly in practice. The city of Sodom, uh, the, perhaps the clearest example in Scripture, repeated for us how uh, the people of Sodom rejected God's authority and indulged themselves in their sinful practice. And, and Korah, who gathered out of the people of Israel fellow rebels, that they would stand and, and reject the appointed rulers of his people, the people that God appointed Moses and Aaron. Now, we made three categories, but I hope that we notice that as we're considering those three categories, there are really different manifestations of the same problem. And what is that problem? In each of those circumstances, the people who are engaged in it are really rejecting the authority of God and saying, I will assess for myself what is good. I will assess for myself what is permissible and what is not permissible. It is a rejection of Christ's authority and a desire to pursue their own desires. That's, that's really what sin is. That's what we all do when we sin. When we sin willfully or or, or in ignorance, really what we're doing is rejecting the authority of God. We're rejecting God's ability to say, this is right, this is holy, this is just. And we're saying, I will determine what is right. I will determine what is holy. I will determine what is just. And we see that all through uh, the history of the Bible as it's recorded for us. For example, when you look at the first sin, the sin of Eve, uh, when she comes to, to the fruit, uh, we know from Genesis chapter 2 that God says, don't eat of this tree of the fruit of knowledge and good and evil. The day you eat of it, you will die. And Satan comes and, and tempts Eve and says to Eve, you will not surely die. And, and Eve listens to the temptation of Satan. And Adam doesn't protect his wife. And so she considers. It says for us in, in Genesis chapter 3, in verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. What does Eve do? Eve assesses the situation for herself. She says, I will have a, a moment to reflect on the truth of what God has said and I will decide for myself whether or not it is something that is useful to me. You see it in the life of Jonah, the prophet, in Jonah chapter 1. God sends him to Nineveh to prophesy, to call the people of Nineveh to repentance. In the next verse, what does Jonah do? He gets on public transit and he goes to Tarshish. He goes the opposite direction that he should have gone to. Why? Because he thinks to himself, I know what Nineveh is like. I know what the Assyrians are like. I don't think it's right for me to speak a message of repentance to these people. I will assess the situation for myself and I will be the determiner of what is right. I will be the determiner of what is just, what is holy, and what is good. That is the example of Scripture. 
this self-assessment, this sinful self-assessment where we set ourselves over God and we say, I will be the judge. And we see it in our own culture as well. I want us to think briefly about the entertainment industry, not to pick on, on them unnecessarily, but how is it that profanity, how is it that immorality like adultery and fornication and even, even sodomy has become so prevalent in music and on the screen? How is that possible? It hasn't always been that way, has it? Even 30, 40 years ago, the things that are on our screen today would have been unthinkable to put on the screen. But what has happened? What has happened is that people who should know better, people who have seen the Word of God say, do this and be holy, have said it doesn't matter. They have said, I will do what is right in my own eyes. I want to express myself this way. I want to uh, enjoy watching these things, hearing these things. I like the beat. Right? This is the same thing. We see it in our culture all the time. In the entertainment industry, think about uh, what we see when we drive down, down I-20 or, or Bobby Jones. How many billboards do you really think are necessary in one city? There is that desire for more stuff. How many commercials do we have to see on television? How many radio spots do we have to listen to that say you need just a little bit more? Now, I'm not saying having stuff is a bad thing. I don't want you to hear that. What I am saying is that in our culture, we have made stuff our God. We have made money our God. We have said this is a thing worth pursuing. What if in our culture we said God is the thing worth pursuing? What would the billboards have on them? Something completely different than stuff. Scripture. Something along those lines. We have a, as a culture have said, God, I know what you think is right. I know what you think is just. I know what you think is holy. And we have walked away from it to pursue other gods. Now, we're 20, 30 years down the road, so perhaps not everybody is thinking that way. But there was a point where somebody said, I will be my own God. I will be the, my own determiner of that which is right, wrong, good, and evil. That is not only true of the culture, of course, but it is in our churches and in our homes as well. Why do you think it is that the evening church services in congregations all over our city, all over our country, are empty, are closing? Why is it uh, that we think that worship of God has devolved into an hour of self-help and, and entertainment? Why do we think that, it, that the, uh, the funnest churches are the biggest churches? How has that happened? Why is it that divorce is so high in the church? Why is it that pastors are caught in infidelity and fraud? Why is it that children suffer at the hands of their parents? It's because what is true of the world is true of the Christian. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones calls uh, people rebels. Not sick people. He calls us rebels. We all rebel against God. We sin in unbelief. We sin in rebellion against God. And we make it our practice to violate the commandments of God. If that was not true of the Christian, why would Jude take the time to write this letter? Why would Jude have to remind the people of God, hold fast, contend for the faith, stand firm? If we were not prone to those kinds of sin, there would be no need for him to write the letter. But Jude has written. He has written repeatedly warning us of danger. He's warned us of sensuality, of denying Christ as, as the master, manifest in, in unbelief and rebellion and in practice. And now in our verses here, in verse 14 and 15, Jude reaches his goal. He issues a warning of judgment. And to do so, he, he quotes First Enoch. It's a in an apocryphal book, the book of Enoch, and he quotes from it. He says this whole idea of what Enoch prophesied 
uh, during, that, during his lifetime comes from uh, that book, that, that apocryphal book of the, the book of Enoch. Now, some people have used that to say that we should neglect the book of Jude. Uh, I think it's simply proper to say that uh, just because it's not inspired scripture doesn't mean it can't be accurate. Uh, we have all sorts of books that communicate truth to us. They're not necessarily inspired, but for, uh, for a scriptural writer to quote from it, he wouldn't be saying anything that would be untrue. Uh, we have uh, train schedules or air, well, maybe not airplane schedules, but we have, we have schedules of transit that, that, that are truthful when you read them. They communicate truth to you. You can count on them. They're not inspired. So the same thing is true with the book of Enoch. It recorded something that was true. And Jude has taken it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and included it in uh, divine, revealed, inspired scripture. And so he simply communicates to us this judgment that is to come as it is prophesied by Enoch. And Enoch said, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. What is God going to do with his host? He's going to execute judgment. What kind of word is judgment? What kind of word is execution? It's a legal word. It is used for the realm of the courts. We don't talk about executing judgment in our families, do we? You've done something wrong, Johnny. I'm going to execute judgment on you. We don't speak of that. That is reserved for the legal realm. It is reserved for those uh, who have the sword, who bear the sword given, given it to them by God. So the implication of the text is that there is a, a legal trans, uh, transgression that has been committed by these false teachers and even by us. The Shorter Catechism is helpful in, in so many ways, and it's also helpful in defining sin for us. It asks the question in Shorter Catechism number 14, what sin is, and it defines sin this way. Sin is a want of conformity uh, to or a transgression of the law of God. So in our sin, we have placed ourselves in a position of legal guilt. All of us have. These false teachers have also. And so God is coming to execute judgment on these false teachers. I want us to notice something. These people are not being judged because they're ignorant. They're not being judged because they're misapplying something uh, by mistake. These people are being judged because they have willfully transgressed against the law of God. Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, speaks to us of the impossibility of somebody uh, being innocent in the sight of God. It says there, For what can be known about God is plain to them, against these wrongdoers, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So these people don't stand before the Lord and are going to have judgment because they are ignorant. They are being judged because of their deeds of ungodliness, Jude says. They're being uh, judged because of the harsh words that they have spoken against Jude, or against God. Jude is saying to them, contend, hold fast, and, and remember your faith, because it is only in the faith that you see rescue from this judgment. We all stand guilty before the Lord. And there is something dreadful about that message, isn't there? Judgment is a, a dreadful thing. It's a, a frightening thing, especially when we, con when we consider that all of us stand guilty before God. The book of Hebrews speaks to us of, of the judgment of God in verses 30 and 31 of chapter 10. It says, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the, Lord's will, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so I understand that as God's people, we come fearful, perhaps, of the judgment of God. And that ought to drive us towards self-examination. We ought to be looking into our own hearts 
asking ourselves, how do I approach life? Do I ask myself in every circumstance, work, church, play, vacation, I don't care what circumstance you find yourself in. Are you asking yourself, what would my Lord Jesus Christ have me do? Or am I asking myself, or am I saying to myself, I know this is what the Bible says, but I would rather do, I would rather say, I would rather think this. It is a question that each of us must ask for ourselves. We cannot see it in the heart of another. And I would urge you, don't just say, of course I ask what God wants me to do first. Don't just say that. Examine your heart. Seek it earnestly, because the way you answer that question is of great significance. I think this dread of judgment also ought to cause us to fear for men's souls. We have seen uh, the fearfulness of falling into the hands of God. And yet we live around all sorts of people who are directly headed in that direction. We're around all sorts of people who are about to be handed over uh, into this dread, this dreadful judgment uh, that will be theirs. Maybe uh, some of you are here now who were facing that judgment. So we ought to ask ourselves the question, how do we escape that judgment? How did we, how did we who are redeemed, how did we escape that judgment? Is it by anything that we did? Is it by uh, our fantastic personality and and the beautiful family that we have, and uh, uh, the success that we've had in, in work? No. It's because Christ rescued you. It's because God saved you. So tell somebody. Tell somebody. Tell somebody the good news of how you were rescued. Tell it to your children, young or grown. Tell it to your neighbors. Tell it to your co-workers. Tell it to your friends. Because without that good news, the word of the Bible is bad news. Because judgment is coming. So there are sins of unbelief and rebellion and, and practice. And these all receive God's judgment. But we are all those things, unbelieving and rebellious and, and unfaithful in our practice. So what, what of us? So I want to look a little bit at verse 16 at the judgment applied. If it is true, and it is true because the Bible says it's true, if it is true that all sin and, and fall short of God's glory, what is it that keeps us from sharing that same fate? Jude gives us a hint today uh, through a snapshot, a description of these false teachers. He says in verse 16, These, meaning these false teachers, are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. These false teachers, they are grumblers, like Israel in the desert. Why can't we go back to Egypt? Don't you remember when we sat uh, in our life of slavery around pots full of meat and it seems like it was just a holiday the whole time? Uh, why can't we go back there? These, these false teachers are grumblers, like the people of Israel. Uh, they grumble against the Lord. They are malcontents, like Absalom, who wanted David's throne when it wasn't his to take. God is the one who anointed the king of Israel, and Absalom wanted to take it for himself. He was malcontent in his position as prince. They are loudmouth boasters like the Pharisees, doing good things to be noticed by men, standing on the street corners, offering long flowery prayers. Why? Because they want to impress the people walking by, that's why. They are boasters. They're speaking of their own success, speaking of their own glory. These men have said to themselves, I determine what is pleasing. I determine what is good. And I will be my own master. But there are two other characteristics. I hope you notice that I left them out. And I left them out on purpose because these other two characteristics that, that Jude gives us of these false teachers give us some comfort and assurance. They help us to see the line. And that is important when we come to a passage like this where there is so much of God's judgment being communicated to us. Uh, the first one that I want to mention that is recorded in our passage is, is that they follow their own sinful desires. 
That is a marked difference between the Christian and the others. Now, I'm not saying we don't ever follow our sinful desires. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. But the Christian sins and then repents. The Christian is not happy in his sin. Not ultimately. I'm not, Christians backslide. We understand that. But the Christian will repent of his sin. Why? Because the Holy Spirit dwells in your heart. He doesn't live perfectly, the Christian, but he does not follow his sinful desires. He desires to walk in the way of Christ. The Apostle Paul was a man. He was a man like we are. And he cried out, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Why? Because he sinned, but he longed to do what is right. That is the difference between the Christian and the unregenerate. So what do you do when confronted with something you know is sinful in your life? To whom do you conform yourself? These are the questions that can give us hope. Hope in seeing that we recognize the need for repentance in our lives, which is a fruit of the Spirit. Or this answer can drive us to Christ, saying, I need to be forgiven. Uh, to whom or to what do you conform in your life? Do you conform to the Bible? Do you conform to public pressure? Do you conform to personal preference? The answer to this question helps you know where your soul is. And if you are unsure of where you are, ask yourself, do I follow my desire or God's desire? When I sin by following my desire, do I come to the Lord in repentance? Do I cry out to Him for forgiveness? Or do I go on my merry way? The second description that I left out was the fact that these false teachers show favoritism to gain advantage. You see this in the church sometimes, don't you? Men who serve in the church, women who serve in the church to further their own position. Maybe somebody wants to put on their resume that they were an elder at, uh, at church XYZ. These people are serving uh, for their own purposes. Pastors and elders and, and people in the pew are all prone to this sin. But the chief end of the redeemed is something quite different, isn't it? How does the catechism define that for us again? What is man's chief end? It's to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Not to glorify Jeff and enjoy Him forever. It's to glorify the Lord God Almighty. But these false teachers, they're about the business of glorifying themselves. They are about the business of furthering their own names through flattery, through showing favoritism. The question for us then is, where will we stand when truth is challenged? Will we stand for truth when it means that it will cost me something, personally? Personally. Will we uh, be willing to be mocked for the truth? Are you willing to be called the stupidest person in the room because you want to be faithful to Christ? Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to make ourselves of no reputation? Or are you going to appeal to men to gain their approval, so that you would be able to advance yourselves. Uh, remember, in Acts chapter 8, there is that story of uh, the work of, of the apostles in converting Samaria. And one of the men, Simon Magus is his name. He was a, a magician. And it says that he believed that he was converted. He was baptized. And as we read through that story, it ought to be heartbreaking to us. Because what does Simon Magus do? He sees the apostles come, put their hands on people, and the Holy Spirit is communicated supernaturally to these people through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And Simon Magus says what? I'll give you some money. Give me this gift also. Who is Simon Magus seeking to glorify? Simon Magus is, is changing arts. He's not changing motivation. Instead of, uh, um, what's he doing? No, um, sorcery, thank you. <laughs> Instead of sorcery, 
he has gone to something completely different. But his goal is the same. Instead of sorcery, he wants the same power, he wants the same influence, but he's simply using a different medium. He is using the medium of Christianity. And so we must ask ourselves, when we serve in the, in the church, do we serve for the glory of God? When we serve in the church and we sin, which we will, when we fail to honor God, when we fail to glorify Him and enjoy Him forever, do we grieve and do we repent? It is the warning of Jude. He says to us, contend for the faith. Do not fall into the judgment of God, but examine yourself. That is what he says to us also. Examine yourself. Cry out to God for mercy and live in hope, knowing what? Knowing that your debt has been paid if you are joined to him by faith. If you are joined to Christ by faith, then he is your master. He is your Lord. He is Jesus Christ. And he was crucified for his people. He was crucified for you and for me. Let's pray.